Anyway, so yeah, our series, The King is Crowned, has been um, based mainly in Isaiah 40, and we've already touched on some context on that in the two previous sermons. I'm just going to add a little bit more about Isaiah 40, and historians tell us that um, Isaiah's chapters 40 to 55 are a big section in the book of Isaiah, and this is where the prophet Isaiah is bringing a powerful word to these people, the Israelites, a powerful word of hope and comfort because they're living in exile. And Isaiah is saying to them, God has not forgotten about you. Your time in exile, though it feels really long, will eventually come to an end. So in our first week of our series, Verna told us that God was going to make a grand entrance on the king's highway to rescue his people. Last week, Wilson spoke about a God who cares for his people with the gentleness of a shepherd for his sheep. Today, I'm going to ask you to remember the incomparable king who's been crowned. We're going to be looking mainly at verses 21 to 26 of chapter 40, and I'm going to read for us. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not considered the foundations of the earth? God is enthroned above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like thin cloth and spreads them like a tent to live in. He reduces princes to nothing and makes judges of the earth like a wasteland. They are barely planted, barely sown. Their stem hardly takes root in the ground when he blows on them and they wither. And a whirlwind carries them away like stubble. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? Asks the Holy One. Look up and see. Who created these? Who brings out the stars by number? He calls all of them by name. Because of his great power and strength, not one of them is missing. We have prayed, but I'm going to pray again. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to sit under the instruction of your word. I pray for my mind and my heart the minds and hearts of the people here before us, that we would not be distracted by the devil and the cables that take issues that have been happening. We thank you that you overcome such things and that your word will not return to you void, but that it will sit in our hearts, convict us, and bring about change. In the name of Jesus, amen. So as I've just said, that the intention of Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 40, starting off in chapter 40 going on, is to comfort Israel, to tell these people that freedom was coming. But unfortunately, they could not see themselves as free. Israel had been in exile for way too long, and their captors, the Babylonians, were strong and powerful. And to be honest, captivity had just become a familiar way of life. There's something in science called epigenetics. And this is the study of how our behavior in our environment can cause changes that affect our genes and the way that the genes work. In other words, this is when your environment, whether it's an environment of trauma, of oppression, of poverty, has so deeply conditioned you that you identify with the trauma, with the poverty, with the oppression. And not only do you identify with it, but you pass it on to your offspring. So it's not that it settles in your nuclear DNA, but it just kind of sits on the surface and it becomes part of who you are. And so Israel was experiencing exactly this. For them, anything else, especially a word that promised freedom, it was a crazy idea. It was a cruel joke. It seemed like a far-fetched dream. For as we just said, they had become so used to captivity, they couldn't imagine that their God was bigger than the gods of Babylon. After all, who was in captivity? It was them, the people of Yahweh. It wasn't the Babylonians. Israel was the one that was living in Babylon. Which is why then, our passage starts off with an interesting question. If you look at that question, do you not know? Have you not heard? If you read chapter 40 of Isaiah, you will be struck that it's actually a a, a chapter that is full of questions, especially rhetorical questions. Let me ask, what is a rhetorical question? Participation class, please. (laughs) What is a rhetorical question? 
Yes. Exactly. It's a question where you don't actually really need the answer. You're not genuinely seeking information, right? You, you're really asking it for a dramatic effect. You're making a point that is known both to you, the asker, and to the answerer. So when God in verse 21 says, do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not considered? He is not asking Israel for information which God doesn't have, no. God knows the answer to the question. Israel knows the answer. For they know, they have heard, it has been declared to them. They have previously considered. The problem is, forgetfulness is a serious plague. Especially to an enslaved people. These people have long forgotten what it was like to live in Judah. And to be fair, if we're honest, many of them have never even been to Judah because they were born in captivity in Babylon. They have forgotten the accounts that were told about an old guy called Abraham to whom God promised the ends of the earth. They ask themselves questions such as, did Yahweh really rescue Israel from Egypt? Did the Jericho march really happen and a wall collapse? They wonder, was there really a little guy called David who defeated a big guy called Goliath? And they say to themselves, perhaps these are just urban legends that a defeated people tell themselves to comfort themselves and just deny their reality. Think about it. Perhaps it might be valid. We too are a forgetful people. We walk into a room to get something. We walk out without it. Totally haven't forgotten what we were going to get. We forget our spouse's birthdays, our children's names. At least I do. On a more serious level, we've forgotten what it felt like to have first encountered God. We've forgotten what it feels like to sit unhurried and enjoy the presence of God. We look back at our lives over the span of many years and we feel heavy. We're overtaken by our troubles. Our lives are chaotic, they're confused, they're conflicted. And it seems like all the rest to these lives is a modern day form of captivity to bills and to bosses. We suffer under a collapsing state, a fragile economy, a disturbed and twisted culture. And we secretly ask ourselves sometimes, are we really saved? So Jesus came, but what did he actually come for? Because many days I feel like if I'm saved, it hasn't made that much of a difference to the circumstances of my life. And while we're still mulling this sad situation, Isaiah adds salt to the wound. Let's look at verse 22. It reads, God is enthroned above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. If I'm reading this right, Isaiah is comparing us and Israel to grasshoppers. I don't know about you, but for me, grasshoppers aren't exactly the most endearing creatures. They're small and they're squishy, but not in a nice, squishy way. You know, they, they're also myopic. They have this narrow vision and they're just busy grazing on grass or the crops and that's all they're concerned about, grazing for that moment, for that meal. They don't look beyond that patch. So I find this description by Isaiah a bit offensive, if I'm to be honest, on the one hand. But on the other, I think he may have a point. Because from our perspective, down here on earth, as I've just said, we do often feel small. We feel in insignificant. We feel far removed from this God who sits far, far above the earth. We feel like he just couldn't be bothered with us like pests whose persistent prayers just go unanswered so many times. Interestingly, if you've noticed, grasshoppers are a common theme in scripture. 
I looked and I counted very up to 14. There's more. 14 references to grasshoppers. But probably the most famous one is in Numbers 13. It's a fascinating, convicting text. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I urge you to go home and read it slowly. I'm just going to do a quick summary of it. This happens where God has successfully brought Israel out from Egypt. They've gone past Mount Sinai. They've done a few things to offend him, and he's killed a few thousands of them along the way. But he's now saying, okay, to the promised land that I've said to you, you're going to go to. So he says to Moses, Moses, send out a number of men to go and spy, on a spy mission to scout out Canaan. So Moses does so. The men go, and they come back with big news. They're excited. They tell the people of Israel, this is indeed the land of milk and honey, as God promised. And they just can't stop raving about the huge grapes, the big watermelons. They excitedly bring in this testimony. But these 12 warriors, or 10, also collapse in a heap of tears. Because they're just like the people of Canaan. They are huge. And the cities are walled up. They're fortified. There is no way that Israel is going to be able to scale those walls. And so to get their point across to Moses, they say, Moses, we saw ourselves like little, small, squishy, insignificant grasshoppers. And we are certain that the Canaanites saw us the same also. So before they even made any attempt at fulfilling the mission of God, Israel could already feel the boots of these Anakites, as they're described in Scripture, as these tall, imposing people. They could feel their boots just squashing them underfoot. Because as we said before, Israel suffered from forgetfulness. They were guilty of forgetting in the first place who had sent them on the spy mission. They had forgotten that God had promised way, way back to give Canaan to Israel. And that if God had made a promise, God would keep it. They had forgotten that God had taken them through the Red Sea. And if he had done that, he wasn't about to drop them now. They forgot also that God was not only bigger than little grasshoppers, but also the tall, imposing Anakites. It's not that Israel didn't know, but Israel forgot. And our refrain is going to be, they knew, they had heard, they had been declared to them, they had considered, but they forgot. We also know, because we have been told, it has been declared to us, but we are too preoccupied with what we see right in front of us. So we need to be reminded. We need to be reminded to stop grazing like grasshoppers, to stop thinking that we are unseen by God. In the words of verse 22, again, we need to be reminded that God is not only seated above, it's not just a, 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 a seat above, but he sits on a throne. What does that mean? What should it communicate to us? Who sits on a throne if not a king? God, our God, the greatest king, he sits on the throne. And from that high point, he has a full view of humanity and all the activities of the earth. God sees us from his vantage point, even from angles that we don't see ourselves. So just because we're as small as grasshoppers doesn't make us invisible to him as we would imagine from our perspective. Instead, it actually makes it easier for him to see us because he doesn't miss a thing. More than that, more than just looking at us and seeing us, God is well positioned to act on our behalf. His hands also work for him. We read in scripture that the arm of the Lord is not too short to reach down and to save. So from that high point where he sees, he also reaches down 
There are many scriptures to testify of this. And I'm sure there are many circumstances in your lives to testify that God reaches down and he saves. And we are to remind ourselves of this. If only for a moment we would stop behaving like grasshoppers and lift up our gaze, we would see more than what is immediately in front of us. In fact, our text in verse 26 invites us to do exactly this. Look up and see, Isaiah says. See what? And he says, we see the heavens. We also see the stars. But oh, we see so much more than that. So much more. Who do we see? We see the great king who created the heavens, who created the stars and pays attention to the stars. The stars which he had said to Abraham, there were too many for him to count. But God, he takes hold of each and every star and he puts them in their place in the heavenlies. He calls them out by name. He calls them out, he says, Orion, Venus, Pleiades, Sirius. Because God knows the stars he has made, not only in number, but by name also. He knows where they each hang. He knows if one of them fizzles out and dies. Listen to how this theologian puts it. The astronomers are still busy engaged in counting and classifying the stars. But Christ has described, counted, and ordered them already. This is the same God who made you, who made me. Though we might feel as small as grasshoppers or as fragile as stars. But God in his great power, in his endless strength, he ensures that none of us go missing from his sight. For if he can keep track of these stars, surely he's keeping track of all our lives and what we're about to. And this gets better because God is not only seeing, he not only acts in our personal troubles, but he also sees on this bigger scale, which we're going to find out about in verses 23 to 24. He reduces the princes to nothing and makes judges of the earth like a wasteland. They're barely planted, barely sown. Their stem hardly takes root in the ground when he blows on them and they wither. And a whirlwind carries them away like stubble. God sees the political machinations and the tyrannical rule of world leaders. He knew about the cruelty of Babylonian dictators. God knows about our modern governments that make life-altering decisions about our lives without a care of the consequences. Leaders who start wars on a whim because I just woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Who play around with countries' currencies for their own personal gain. Judges who make unjust decisions in exchange for brown envelopes. Yet Isaiah would say to us, don't spend energy, don't pay attention to these self-made men. Look up and see. Because if you look up and see here before you is one who's greater than all of these men. To him, though they are powerful people to us, but to God they're just puny puppets. Their small minds cannot even begin to imagine how incomparable and other than themselves the one true king and ruler of heaven and earth is. As I was reading this text, Isaiah 40, I could not help but see the parallel between this and Psalm 2, one of my favorite psalms. So please indulge me. I'm going to read the whole psalm from the Living Bible because it has this picturesque language of putting it. Just put yourself in this text. What fools the nations are to rage against the Lord. How strange that men should try to outwit God. For a summit conference of the nations has been called to plot against the Lord and his Messiah, Christ the King. Come, let us break his chains, they say, and free ourselves from all the slavery to God. But God in heaven merely laughs. He is amused by all their puny plans. And then in fierce fury, he rebukes them and fills them with fear. For the Lord declares, this is the king of my choice, and I have enthroned him in Jerusalem, my holy city. His chosen one replies, I will reveal the everlasting purposes of God. 
For the Lord has said to me, you are my son. This is your coronation day. Today I am giving you your glory. Only ask and I will give you all the nations of the world. Rule them with an iron rod. Smash them like clay pots. O kings and rulers of the earth, listen while there is still time. Serve the Lord with reverent fear. Rejoice with trembling. Fall down before his son and kiss his feet. Before his anger is roused and you perish. I am warning you, his wrath will soon begin. But oh, the joys of those who put their trust in him. Oh my, leaders of the world make a lot of noise. They expect us to cower and to bow down when they just say, jump and we just say how high. But God, the incomparable king, he looks at them and he laughs. They're a joke to him. And this applies whether you're the president of the United States, whether you are the absolute monarch of a neighboring country that shall go unmentioned, whether you are that political party that's apparently going to rule until Jesus returns. To God, these people, they count for nothing. They are like straw. While they're hobnobbing, wheeling, dealing, scheming, God snaps his fingers and they are no more. He renders these leaders useless because the kingdoms of this world, the governments of this world belong not to them, but to our incomparable king. And today and every day is his coronation day as Psalm 2 says. Which is why then, Isaiah asks another pertinent question in verse 25. And yes, it's another rhetorical question. And it reads, to whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? And there's a question which Isaiah had already asked in verse 18. We didn't read it, but if you just look up in your text, you'll see in verse 18, he asks the same question. Now, I think we know enough about Scripture to know that Isaiah hadn't run out of words, so he just felt like repeating this question. No, he's making emphasis to whom will we compare God because it's a question that he wants us to seriously consider. Israel, Isaiah is asking, who do you compare God to? Is it to the handmade idols of Babylon? Is it even to the stars whom the Canaanites and the Babylonians worshipped? Is it to the deep oceans or mighty mountains, which other verses of Isaiah 40 speak of? Isaiah is also asking us, to whom do we compare God? To presidents, to prime ministers? Do we compare God to our boyfriends, our wives, our bank accounts? Our good looks or the strength of our youth? Again, something which later on in Isaiah, Isaiah 40, he refers to that. Isaiah is asking, who do we compare God to? For whatever or whomever we compare him to, God is like none of these things. Nothing and no one is like our God and King. He is the uncreated creator who made us the stars and the grasshoppers. He is the one in whom everything finds its beginning and continuance. Unlike the little gods we make for ourselves, God is unmade. He was there before the beginning. While the earth was dark, formless, void, God came and shone his light, his light that cannot be put out. And he gave the earth form and structure. God spent time putting everything in its place, making his earth beautiful and perfect. Unfortunately, we, his creation, humanity, came and made a huge mess of it all. So 2,000 years ago, he entered the world in the form of a human. But 700 years before that, Isaiah came and proclaimed to Israel to be a people who would wait in hope and expectation for the true king of Israel. But though they're living in captivity under a foreign 
a leader in, in foreign gods. There was their true king who was still coming as deliverer and savior. 2,700 years later, we are people who are living in a time when Isaiah's prophecy has been fulfilled. The way has been prepared, as we learned in the first week. The good news has been shouted from the tops of Mount Zion. And the news came to pass. The true king called Yeshua came. Yes, he came in the form of a baby, but he grew up. And he went about doing good, scripture tells us. He went about freeing all who were oppressed by evil, healing the sick, mending broken hearts. He did all of this while living a sinless life so that he could die for a sinful people. Then in his greatest act of victory, he defeated death and was resurrected to glory. And today he sits at the right hand of God the Father in the fullness of his majesty. And though he's not here right now in human form, we must remind ourselves of the great works that we read about that he did, of the great works that he continues to do today. For surely if he is a God who cares enough to count stars and to name them, he also cares about our personal and our political plights. We must remind ourselves that he's a God who keeps his promises and the promise that he would come before he fulfilled, therefore he will fulfill the promise that he will return. For the good news has been declared to us. We have heard it. We must consider it. We cannot claim ignorance. We cannot allow ourselves to forget especially at this time. In obedience to him, we must remain remembering that he is incomparable, he is inexhaustible, he is infinite. Remember, remember the incomparable king.